1, the time here at 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future of radio. I'm Cliff Russell. This is the Cliff Russell Show. And let me remind you once again, our phone number is 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600. And you're going to want to get your dialing fingers ready for this brother I have here in the studio with me right now. Mario Bueno is the author of the book Reform, Memoir of a Juvenile Killer. Grew up right up the road in Pontiac, Michigan, and boy, does he have a story to tell, not only of the hard life and the rough stuff, but a story of redemption and reformation and one of reaching out to other people to try to get them that good message and that good news. Was that, was that good enough for you, Mario? Did that tell the story the right way? I'm humbled, absolutely. All right, it's good to have you here, man. Good afternoon to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. I'll talk a little bit about your start in Pontiac. How was it that you became the um, angry, hard, uh, criminally minded, uh, involved young man that you did in Pontiac, Michigan. What was that all about? What what <clears throat> what put you in that place? Well, you know, we're talking about the eighties. Uh, th that was the cocaine cowboy days, right? <clears throat> There's a period that my, my family and I we lived in Miami. You know, there was a space I think during the early adolescent years that that my parents were struggling, and, and that, as many do, mm -hmm. and th that struggle transcended. Uh, transcended to the children. It, it, it affected the children. The soil does affect the seed. Right. 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 And and it created a space to where it created a space to where I could uh, actually it, at that age you're very impressionable, right? Mm hmm So so I had some older gentlemen around me who were drug dealers, gang leaders, and having and lacking that that positive male role model around 12, 13 until 16, I think. I think that's what really propelled me into uh, uh, the criminal mindset. The guys who are in a gang, and I don't know if people understand that the guys who may be in a so-called gang or selling dope to, or together, whatever, they have love for each other. That's like a family, isn't it? Well, you know, one of the, it's funny you say that because one of the workshops and, and training on self-awareness that I do for young Young, young adolescent males like, like, like that, that think like I used to think. <clears throat> we have four basic human needs, and one of them is love slash connection. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's love per se, but it's definitely a sense of connection. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. right. I mean, you know, you feel that these guys have got your back, you've got their back. That's what a family does. Yeah, yeah especially at a time where you're, you're lacking that sense of familial bonding, mm -hmm. that sense of connection and yeah, you you actually mistaken you mistaken it for love. Right, right. How did you get so deep into the drug game? Was it the money? Was it the prestige? Yeah. What, what was what was appealing to that good, about good you? Good question. You know, at, at that time, you know, you talk was it the women? <laughs> well, definitely not the women, because I started at 13, 12, 13. So it was definitely the money. Uh -huh. But you talk, you know, as I reflect, I was 10, 11, 12 years old, begging, begging God to save my mom. Mm -hmm. And, and by 12 to 13, I just stopped. I stopped talking to a to a silent God who wasn't responding. Uh, around that same time, that's when my my father and I stopped talking. Mm -hmm. So so for the next few years, I became angry and and self absorbed in in the love of money. Yes. And, right. They say that the root of all evil is money, but not the love the of love money. Love of money. Yeah. Say that. Right. So yes. I I made money my god. And and as I reflect as a grown man with insight, I'm going on 40 this year. I was 16 when I pulled that trigger and when I used to rob and harm drug. I developed a paradigm and a belief system that said it was okay to rob and harm drug dealers. Mm -hmm. If you were in the game, you were fair game. Right. Right. And, and and so that's that was the justification and the rationality that I possessed. Um, so you, you had an angry young boy that was blaming drug dealers for his home situation. Right. Um, and, and and disconnected from a biological father. Yes. And you mix those two and, and, and with access to weapons and, mm -hmm. and access to that criminal world. And you, you have a, a, a dangerous cocktail. Now, you committed murder. Yes, I did. Unfortunately. Before and after that, was there any remorse? Was there any emotion? Or did you feel completely justified and, oh, well, I did that. Let me go. But that's you know, an excellent question. Coke now. That's, well, that's an excellent question. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, at that time, 
I had a list of drug dealers that I was going to rob and kill at that time. Okay. Right? Uh, at that time, at 16, the pain and anguish. I, I did 387 days in solitary confinement as I fought this case. Wow. So right? over a year. Yeah. Over a year in solitary at 16. Mm -hmm. The pain and anguish that I did feel. Right? I cried out to a God, and I, and I, and I cried out in, in the pain that I felt for self. Like yeah. what I lost. Right, right. I think at that age and with the emotional quote, the EQ that I possessed at that age, I didn't have the wherewithal to concern myself with what Samuel lost or what his family lost. Yeah. Forget Samuel. Right. But 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 as I sat in front of that pro board member, uh, Dr. King, he's a MSU professor on psychology. Mm -hmm. um, I expressed to him today, I do cry. And the tears that I shed today are for Samuel. Uh, for Samuel's 19, 20, 21 year old kid. And you're sincere about that. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I possess the capacity yes. to do so. Uh, you're talking to a man now who has been in so much different training, but I've also been trained in empathy awareness, where I've had to sit across from um, uh, mothers of murdered children for example, right. and, and, and play the role of the perpetrator or, or, or cr crime stoppers, for example. Right, right. I've, done, I've done seminars at U of M where, where I played the perpetrator of a mother who have, has a, a murdered son and the perpetrator hadn't been caught yet. So, so I've, I've, I've literally had to sit there and think about how it would feel sitting across from Samuel's mother and let her know that every single waking breath that I possess, I do so. And, and, and I mourn Samuel. I forgive myself. I mourn him, though, in how yes. I live. Let me remind yeah. our listeners that our very special guest in the studio is Mr. Mario Bueno, the author of the book Reformed, <laughs> Memoir of a Juvenile Killer. Also, our phone number is 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600. At what point or what person or what event turn you around where you had the capacity, as you said, to actually feel sorry for Sam, where you had to actually had the capacity to look at yourself in an honest way as to what you had become as opposed to what you really wanted to be? Good question. Good question. <clears throat> you know, there's an old saying that, that, you know, when you're born again, bo baptism is really about a death, right? So you die to yourself. But right. when, when you're born again, right. it's funny. You say, you know, Jesus might be in your heart, but your granddaddy's in your bones. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so so, literally on day four of solid, they didn't know what to, Oakland County Jail didn't know what to do with me. Mm -hmm. Right? I was remanded to Oakland County Jail while there were other juveniles charged with murder, automatically waived as adults in 1995. They were being held in juvenile facility. So Oakland County Jail didn't know what to do with me. The first three days, I was sitting in a, a bullpen in healthcare, sleeping on the floor. The fourth day, they said they decided to put me in a back holding cell. It was it an was individual cell. And they put me there. Well, they put me in there. And then I remember I, I got on my knees and I challenged God. I, on day four now, you know, at 16, I was, you know, smoking marijuana every day, hustling. Right. right. But now I'm sober and I'm remembering when I was 11, 12, 10, 11, 12, praying to a God who wouldn't answer my prayer. And I got on my knees literally and I challenged God. And I said, if you would have answered my prayer then, this wouldn't have happened. That's what I said. Did you get a response? Of course not. I'm, 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 I'm sure. Well, let me finish. So, okay. <laughs> so, so what I did was I, I challenged God. I said, if you save me, I'll spend the rest of my life helping men like myself. Mm -hmm. I, I remember calling back on, the, on that plastic mat and I passed out. You know, you you can't, there's no windows in, in solitary, in this solitary. I've been quite a few solitaries. There's no windows. So what, oh, what what woke me up was a slap on the floor. And I jumped and I looked and the door was closing. And the sheriff was walking away and there was a Bible on the ground. Mm -hmm. I ended up reading that Bible three times in the 387 days, right? Wow. So now, so now when, when I was convicted and sentenced, because everyone thought I was going to get off. The first trial was a hung jury. Right. They came and asked if I would take a deal to testify against the two people who told on me. Right. Right? I, I played an alibi defense. I was, they called me uh, Babyface Nelson. I was a, a young, tough kid. They right. interrogated me. Right. I, right. I was a smart mouth. I was all that, right? Right. I, right? And so when I was found guilty and sentenced to 19 or 22 to 40 years, I didn't consider that covenant or that contract sealed. I considered it null and void. Mm -hmm. I remember a couple years later, I was on the phone with my biological father, and he said, you know, son, I won't pay for for your attorney, because I don't agree with what you what you did, but I'll pay for your education. And I told him, I said, I said, I said, Dad, I said, uh, I'm never coming home. 
I mean, I was about 17, 18, right. out of an adult prison yard. Right. I remember a tear coming down my eye. So I'm never coming home, Dad. I said, I'm going to be the best convict I can be. Well, I said, what's a degree going to do for me? Mm -hmm. And over the next several years, you know, it's funny. You can get, you can find the worst place in prison. <laughs> now, they'll put you in a prison right. under the prison, right? right so right, right, so right. I ended up doing a total of about three years in solitary before the age of 22. Mm -hmm. Adjustment issues. Think about it. Think about being a 16-year-old going to a new high school. Now think about going to right. a prison. Right, going to a prison, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Adult prison, right? Exactly. So eventually, right, eventually, I, I through, through, you know, you, I think it's through the physiological maturational process, you know, obviously socially, emotionally. I'm reading, I read over a thousand books, right? But my point is, e eventually, it was an aha moment. I was a solitaire. I still remember it. And I was reading the autobiography of Nelson Mandela. Ah. Right? And I'm, re I'm reading about a guy who, Worked 15 hours a day in coal mines. Right. Could barely pay for one meal a day. Mm -hmm. Studied at candlelight when he wasn't working. All the freest people. Yes. And, and I'm sitting here a murderer, angry at the world with a mindset of, of scarcity. Blaming a God who, an unseen God for dealing me a bad hand and then playing the hand badly. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And until finally I understood really what Romans 8, 28, all things happen for the good for those who love God really means. Yes. All things. That's wow. actually the inscription I got in my graduation ring. Um, how about wow. the Warriors, Wayne State? You know, I got a BS and accountant from Wayne State since I've been home. Yes. But um, By the way, I'm a Wayne yeah. State grad. Hey, too. Yeah. I got to give you some props. I knew wow. I liked you, man. <laughs> hey, Ryan Mack might be listening. Oh, you have been boom. Wayne State all the way, man. Green all the way. All right, so now you have this incredible revelation, this incredible epiphany. It's grace. Uh, definitely grace. Life, grace. Definitely grace. In your life. Definitely grace. So how do you, what is the plane of your life after that? All of a sudden, what do you start doing? So, so I, you know, it's funny because at age 26, the insurance companies actually dropped the rates for young males. At age 26, in the Michigan Department of Corrections and all Department of Corrections, they give you a positive point for behavior-wise for all males who turn 26. Mm -hmm. So we, we've known for quite some time that physiologically speaking, the frontal lobe of your brain that deals with impulsivity doesn't even fully develop in males until 26. So you're 26. Wow. Right, well, coincidentally, serendipitously, around 26, I started... I started about 26, 27, 28. I was, now, mind you, I was kicked out of nine prisons. Right. Served in 16 different, kicked out of nine and deemed incorrigible at one point. So around 26, 27, I, I started praying to that unseen God again. And I started telling God, you know, I, I love you, but I don't know how to. Mm -hmm. and, I, and what I've come to find out is one of the most dangerous prayers you can pray is, is the prayer of, of use me, God. Yes. <laughs> Be careful what you pray for. Use me, guy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, be careful now. Right, Use exactly. me, guy. Right, so I started, I began this process, and over a few years, I started bouncing around, but now I was being transferred for good reasons. And and, and eventually, I got to a place in 2011 where I, I, I got kicked out of another prison, but I got to a place where they were training guys of influence, not for the good, guys of negative influence, such as my, I had a, I'm Latino, so I had a lot of influence on prison. Mm -hmm. And I was a drug trafficker. And I, so I was, you know, you make money, you, right. unfortunately, right? So they pulled me into this program, and there, it was a pilot program that they were going to try to transform the most violent 17 to 25 year olds on the prison yard. That population is very high risk in prison, especially level ones. So they're trying to get street cred before they go home. Right, right. And so, so they put me in this classroom with all 17 to 25 year olds, and I'm like 33. Right. Right? Wow. And I had an associate's degree thus far. My dad was able to pay for my associates before I came home. Wonderful. Amen. So I got a head start. Right. Right? Reach one, teach one. It's all you know, <laughs> the better do, right. the more you know, the better you are. So so I, I, I literally expanded exponentially. I just I, I grew significantly quickly. And and Rick, uh, uh, one of my best friends and co-founder of Luck Inc., it's a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We're a service provider in Detroit now. I knew him from 2001, and it wasn't when we were good boys. Right. 